Let's see, we're live. We are live. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, I'm double checking this time. Yes, audio should definitely be going on. Um, Sabah, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, or see, actually, I'm not the first. Am I a little bit late? Yes, uh, I do apologize. A couple of minutes late. Uh, Lani's in the chat. Aljosa's in there. Marilyn, Greg is in there as well. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Um, it is Saturday, June 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you know, we're, we're pretty much almost in the middle of the year now. I mean, we're pretty, you know, we, we finished May, um, you know, we're, we've gone through a lot of announcements, a lot of smartphones were coming out, coming out. We heard obviously about the, you know, Sony Xperia, uh, videos coming up. We talked about that a little bit on the uh, best of our week on Wednesday or on Thursday night with Juan Carlos, but it, I didn't get a chance to check out some of those videos till today. So I did have a chance to check, uh, check out some of those videos and want to talk a little bit more. Um, the other thing I also wanted to talk about, obviously, is uh, Sabaho. Uh, Bob, good morning, Sabaho. Helen. Um, is uh, some of the other things as far as OnePlus coming back and they're resuming their Android 12 beta or alpha or um, I guess the, essentially what they're doing essentially is they're releasing their alpha, the developer preview of Android 12 for OnePlus devices. So essentially an Android 12 or an Oxygen OS 12 uh, beta or alpha release. Now it's stable enough that we're able to install it. It still may and actually damage or brick your device. So they're not recommending it for everybody. And this is not necessarily a daily driver. And I want to talk to you guys about it a little bit. I did uh, go ahead and flash it on my OnePlus 9. This is the US edition OnePlus 9. And um, uh, there's some caveats, some things to talk about as far as the experience going on with it. Uh, I've had the, I've had actually my SIM card in the smartphone for the last 24 hours. And I'm actually ramping up for a video that hopefully we'll be publishing on Monday morning. So expect an actual video covering specifics on all of that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Bob says good afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, depending where um, depending where you are in the world, uh, it may be morning, uh, you know, afternoon. Uh, for us here in Southern California, since I'm in California, it's actually still technically morning. It's 10 a.m., 10, 7, 10, 19 a.m. Um, here in the uh, on the West Coast. So uh, again, depending where you guys are, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, June started off with a little bit of a somewhat of a lull and not really a lot of things going on in the news. Uh, the big thing for me, at least as far as what I've been uh, focusing on for the last couple of weeks, I pushed out a video on the OnePlus, uh, on the OnePlus watch. Now, the OnePlus watch was announced and surprisingly to some people, actually, it's been announced about two months ago now. And I've had my hands on that device or that watch for some time, but I held off on my review. I wanted to share with you guys my thoughts on the OnePlus watch after it's been going through a couple of updates and actually receiving all of the updates that OnePlus promised us. And what I meant by that is at launch, they announced a whole set of things for the OnePlus watch. And then what we saw also is that the, the watch came out with some of those features not necessarily rolled out yet. And then, of course, they were promised within a certain time frame. Sure enough, OnePlus did deliver on that time frame, and we have them on the watch. And uh, the video kind of uh, covers all of the main benefits of what's going on with the watch, the always on display, uh, the new AI uh, watch face uh, function that they have built in there. Uh, the ability of adding 110 different activity mo modes in there. And I also made sure to showcase those in the video so that people know exactly what they are. Um, although didn't cover them one by one, I made sure to show the list itself. Uh, Jemmy's in the chat. Greg again. Uh, yes, I just watched Juan's Infinix. Yes, uh, Juan also posted the Infinix uh, Note 10 Pro, uh, a really good budget smartphone from Infinix uh, that is promising a lot of good benefits for, for a decent amount of money, actually, if you think about it. Um, <laughs> Abdel uh, uh, Naufil, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Ab Abdel uh, Naufil, hopefully I'm saying that. Good afternoon in Poland. Uh, that is true. See, it's evening, and depending if we have any any of our friends from uh, from India, it's probably even further in the evening, as it's probably already early morning in uh, on Sunday morning. Um, Pennsylvania is in the afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> that, that definitely. Uh, so, you know, one of those things I, I definitely appreciate about that is what OnePlus did. They released the watch. They delivered on the promise. Now, there are obviously some things that were hits and some things that are misses. And I did make sure to cover that in the video. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please make sure to check out that video. That was the literally the only video I posted on the English channel and as well as the Arabic channel as well, if you guys are following me on that one. Um, uh, Mabombo is asking, uh, mentioning here, the Sony Xperia 1 Mark III is so expensive that it's not worth, in my opinion, since uh, you can get that for, uh, you can get last year's Xperia 1 for about $700, less than half the price. So that's an interesting approach. Uh, I think the initial reaction to any time a price is released from any company is that this is just too much, right? Depending on what they're asking. And Sony's pricing has, for the most part, been kind of going up for the last few years. 
Um, I, it's hard for me to kind of answer the question or basically comment on the pricing based on the market that it's in currently. It's only available in China. So those marking or the pricing that is available there, when converted to US dollars, it's never 100%. I mean, we've seen this happen with Xiaomi. They release devices in China and they're released at a specific price. And then you see it come into the global market and it's a little bit more expensive. What I'm trying to say is it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Uh, but keeping in mind of what you get with the Sony Xperia 1 Mach 3. I'll say that before uh, we jump into absolutely if you're if you're a fan of Sony the one mark II from last year is available it's actually available in all markets right now and it definitely is a much better deal than having to basically uh, you know wait up and if, if the price obviously on the new one is not necessarily to your liking so I recommend the one uh, the one mark II for sure um, and I don't really think if you want to keep in mind though that the one mark three for the most part is not intended to be an upgrade for last year's phones it's intended for the people that went with the first Xperia 1 because the Xperia 1 is the one that's been out for a couple of years. The, the, the updates that we see here, obviously, with the stereo speakers, the headphone jack, the wireless charging, all of those things, a lot of that stuff is already on the One Mark II. So you have to focus on some of the big differences. So I, what I would probably say is if you've upgraded, for, if you're thinking of going for either the One Mark II or the One Mark III, being that the one Mach 3 right now isn't available everywhere, plus the fact that if you import it, transfer it, shipping, and all of that, it's going to be more expensive than what it currently is since it's not on the market that it's intended. Uh, I recommend you going definitely for sure with the Xperia 1 Mark 2. Uh, absolutely, hands down, you get the video input, you get the cameras, you get Android 11, you get the security updates that they've been pushing out on it. And literally a lot of the, almost on, almost all of the features that you get with the Xperia 1 Mark 3, with the exception of the hardware limitations, there are some hardware changes. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, Mabombo, is the the price increase is caused by the improvements that they've done. We have a 4K 120 hertz refresh rate camera, as well as a 4K 120 hertz refresh rate display, a slightly bigger battery. Um, overall, aesthetics is slightly different. We have a uh, basically a fourth focal length now that we have. So a primary, a primary and ultra wide, a telephoto, and then basically a higher telephoto with the movable lenses. So that justifies the pricing. And at least in the US, we know now that it's going to be coming up with 5G, which is also a big jump from what we had last year with the Xperia 1 Mach 3. So just keep in mind, it's not a one for one. There are some upgrades. It's a much bigger jump, though, if you go from the one to the one Mark three than it is from the one Mark two to the one Mark three. I don't know how many times I can say one Mark and one Mark. You know, I'm just messing around. But I hope hopefully that answers the question. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to flash the question. This this was uh, my, uh, my Bombo's uh, question here. Uh, Big also's in there. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, hey, Fat Produce is in the chat, man. How you doing, Andrew? Uh, and of course, uh, Big also's in there. Uh, Rinesh, hey, man. Good morning. Good morning. El Josa's jumping in. Hey, man. Hope you're doing well. Um, I got my Mi 11 Ultra Chinese version. It was about 450 pounds cheaper than the global one here in the UK. Makes perfect sense. Uh, yesterday, the main sensor is just true. It's truly bonkers. Uh, what do you What do you make of it, um, TK? Honestly, this is one of those surprise smartphones to me in 2021 because my initial exposure with, with Xiaomi's devices this year was the 11. Then we got the 11 Ultra, which I still don't think it's in the same family. I really think they named it the 11 just to kind of compete with the name, to say it's in the Mi 11 series kind of thing. The Mi 11 Ultra typically was never an international device. It was primarily Chinese only. So last year's Ultra, for the most part, we saw what they did with it. It was primarily for China. The GN2 sensor on this is absolutely crazy. Uh, the updates that we've seen, and the other thing I would probably say, Aljosa, is make sure you update to the uh, MIUI 12.5.3, which is the latest stable update that they pushed out. And there's really not much to, to say. It, it takes amazing pictures. The focal length on it is amazing. Uh, it has that natural drop, the, the focus level drop right behind the subject because of the way it's set. Um, so you're getting a really good high-end camera on the back sensor there. Um, unfortunately, the experience on the front is not exactly the best, but... Um, I might, again, what we're waiting on right now essentially is the update to allow us to use that back sensor, though not the back sensor, the small display on the back as a camera. So uh, this is the first time I don't have the Mi 11 Ultra within arm's reach. Uh, and I could be, that is interesting. Okay, I got to figure out. I'm hoping my son's not playing with the camera. Uh, typically, that's what happens. The phone on my desk disappears and I got to go hunt my son. Oh, <laughs> It's right there. Uh, so what we're talking about essentially is this display, this little tiny display on the back. That little display that we we get there, do apologize for the dust, needs more functionality. So that would be my only thing. 
I think we, when you're using the Mi 11 Ultra, you need to basically live and die by that main GM2 sensor on the back. Everything else, for the most part, is a good experience, but just doesn't live up at the same level. But images from there come out beautiful, uh, really good low light, 8K, 4K, 60, a whole bunch of things. So I'm very, very pleased with how it's performing. Um, and I'm glad that you're able to check it out. Uh, my question would be essentially, um, with it being the Chinese model, um, are you getting the right bands or supported bands to get the at least 4G LTE or even 5G for you here in the UK or over there in the UK? Let me see here real quick. Uh, Big Oso is looking here. So, okay. So I'm looking for an upgrade from a OnePlus 7. So the OnePlus 7, if you remember, this one came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it came out with the 7 Pro the early in the year, and it came out actually in specific markets and it didn't come out in every market. So the OnePlus 7 as an upgrade, realistically, the 8 would have been a decent upgrade, but the 9 this year would definitely be great. Uh, when you're thinking about a smartphone, the 9, at least, and I'll, and I'll actually, I'll stop back. The OnePlus 9 in the markets that it supports wireless charging is a nice upgrade. You get the, definitely the, the wireless charging for 15 watts. It's not the fastest. I still think 90% of the time I go wired. I don't really go wireless as much. It's nice to have, but again, it's like I feel like it's an extra, but... It's just so slow compared to the 65 watt charger on this. It just doesn't make sense to me. So when we look at that from when we look at that from the aspect of upgrades and, and functionality, this is truly like a, a very a massive step upgrade for what you get with the OnePlus 7. Because the OnePlus 7 for me was a minor upgrade to the OnePlus 6T that came out a year before, right? They fixed a few things. They changed the haptic motor on that one. Uh, they got us the silver color. I remember checking that out in UK in the UK when I was able to still travel to the UK. It was like went back in the day. So uh, if I'm if I was to recommend something to you, the the nine and the nine Pro are definitely massive upgrades. I feel like you can save a little bit of money on the nine Pro specifically because we have so much of the nine Pro in the nine. So definitely one plus nine, I would say is a, is a shoe in. And if you want to be able to play with Android twelve, which we are going to talk about, uh, it's definitely a nice upgrade there. Uh, let me see here a little bit more. Oops, and it jumped. Uh, let me see here. This thing always does that all the time. Uh, Donald Lazino's in the chat. Sabah, man. Hope you're doing well. DT is in the chat, man. Hope you're doing well. I hopefully school, everything is going well. Um, unfortunately this week, I did not get a chance to play, uh, with Dan, um, Zergeist, uh, as much as well. He was streaming. I couldn't help. Uh, I couldn't join in. I was unfortunately just, let's just say this day job this week was definitely taking up all the time. So we'll see how things go. And then the other thing, which I don't think you guys could see, um, I, I've went, I've gone through a little bit of a spring cleaning session in the studio. And what happened is I've, I think over time I've accumulated a whole bunch of stuff and I wasn't really organizing things. And it started to feel a little bit more like on top of where I am. So it just felt mentally, not just, I wasn't very comfortable. I wasn't feeling that I felt like things were kind of closing in, which I didn't really want to say in, in, in making it sound like as bad as it sounds. But I think what it needed was for me to sit down and spend some time organizing and cleaning and getting rid of things that I don't really need. Um, I tend to keep boxes for everything all the time. I'm one of those, if I buy a phone and I'm not using it all the time, I still have the box for it. But then, you know, what happened is like over time, I've collected boxes where I've actually no longer had the phone form, but I had to go through that. So I went through that. I cleaned up some stuff. There was actually also a nice little uh, package that got dropped over to my uh, door yesterday from um, actually Rode. Uh, they were happy with the coverage that we did on the Rode uh, Wireless Go uh, 2, the microphones that were sent to us, of course, uh, Juan Carlos and myself. And they sent me a really nice upgrade to it, which I really wasn't so expecting. So it's a um, it's called a mic drop, which in theory doesn't make sense. Uh, and then the other thing they also sent me, hold on, let me show you guys real quick here. The other thing they sent me was a Lavalier Go. It's another actually upgraded microphone that we can use with the wireless Go 2, which, believe it or not, guys, I've been using this as my main main uh, microphone system. But what I really like about this is this mic drop. Whenever we're actually setting up or micing anybody, uh, specifically when I'm putting on my mic, the biggest problem I always, always have is when I'm running the mic down my shirt to put it in so that it doesn't actually sit up uh, in a position where, you know, everybody can see it. And then you're having to, you know, fizzle. And if you're wearing a nice shirt, this ends up becoming an issue. This mic drop is really, really functional. Look at this. It adds a weight to the mic so that it essentially is you run it from the shirt at the top and you just put it down and it literally drops the mic all the way down. Once you get it where you need it, you take out the weight and it's done. Simple, little, easy, and absolutely functional when you're waiting to, you know when you're trying to basically do some stuff very nice i really like it i mean i was surprised to see it still uh but i'm definitely going to be checking it out and uh, all the audio for next week's video on will be using the new uh this is the lavalier go again brand new microphone from uh, rode and it works very nicely with this one so uh 
it was a surprise. I, all I can say is we saw the UPS guy yesterday at the door and I was like, I'm not expecting anything. So I was very happy. Thank you very much to Rode um, for making awesome, awesome audio equipment. And I am also working with another company as well um, in the near future to try to also test out some additional mics. But yeah, short, short conversation. Absolutely bang, a uh, little gift there. And uh, I'm looking forward to testing it out, especially on the video for Monday with the OnePlus 9 uh, Android 12 uh, update. <laughs> well, TK, just say Sony. Sony, Sony, Sony. I can just sit here and do a couple of things. So we're going to do a couple of minutes of Sony, Sony, you know, Sony, and then Sony because Sony and Sony. No. Um, yeah, no, Greg's, Greg is having, having some good time. Um, dude, I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing well. I'm, I'm glad DT is doing good. Uh, I know, uh, we, he and I talk a little bit offline, so we had a chance to talk a little bit more. Um, yes. So as far as the Android 12, so here, the, um, what Greg is talking about essentially is Android 12 beta two, which would hopefully be coming up to, to OnePlus devices. So OnePlus typically starts their, their release of Android 12 a little bit later than Android 12, because they need to wait till the beta version of the, of the official Android 12 comes out because of the delay and when they have access to the code and when they're able to basically start releasing it. So the first thing I'll probably will say it's rough, right? This is not a final version. This is not a stable version. I'll say that even more. Um, my phone has boot looped so many times on, and I'm talking about the OnePlus 9, that it, I, I definitely understand the, that this is not what you should be using. But it definitely looks nice. So let's just do a quick look since um, Greg was pushing us in with that, with that conversation. But yes, we should be expecting Android 12 to be coming out very, very soon. Uh, beta 2, I think, was what he's talking about. So uh, this is the OnePlus 9. Again, I flashed with the Android 12. Uh, the one thing I'll probably say is the brightness, it may seem like it's a little bit too bright here. And that's something, one of the bugs in there. Uh, if I try to change the brightness on it, let's go ahead and do that here. So here, brightness level, I'm going to just change it a little bit, let it go and give it a second. Typically, this is what happens when, when I do this. It just start, basically, it just dies and restarts. Uh, but we'll give it a second. Uh, I am running on 5G. You can definitely see it right there. So I am able to pick up 5G on T-Mobile here in the US. Uh, the live stream is showing up here. Let me see here. And yeah, so we can see the video live stream is right there. We'll go ahead and open it up. I'm going to go ahead and bring it home, bring it in. And then we can see now that the pinch and zoom function is working. That's one thing to bring in. And then stashing is also working for us, which we're able to do with Android 12. Now, right now, unfortunately, it is playing an ad. I don't want to basically keep running the ad. Let's go ahead and skip the video. I'm going to bring down the audio. You can see here also the new aesthetics that they brought in with the volume rocker here. So I'll go ahead and hit home. The video is still sitting there. Uh, but again, it's just very nice, very easy to use and very simple. If I want to bring it down, close it, works great. Uh, the settings tab looks a little bit uh, more stock looking. It doesn't actually have a lot of Android uh, Android uh, Oxygen OS look. And then when it comes down to the settings menu, it actually pretty much looks like stock Android. Um, they, they did support uh, dark mode, and I did turn that on. So here, dark theme, turn that off. And this is pretty much what it kind of looks like. Uh, screen, you have Q color sitting at the bottom, enhancing the color options. You, have, you can pick up between HP, no. Those are the different modes that are built in here. Uh, I like to keep uh, night light, or not light night, uh, to get back. Here it is, dark theme, bring it back. And uh, overall, you know, we have safety emergency system, Android 12 update here. Um, I didn't turn on gestures yet, but I did do a quick speed test yesterday here. Um, I was able to, I mean, it wasn't the best connection, 240 down, but 1.24. Uh, and again, it just depends on where you're connected and where you're able to run it. Uh, the overall aesthetics, the camera application is running. Uh, but again, random reboots seriously are plaguing this device uh, all around. Uh, I did see that essentially all the modes are in here. So if we go under video, we'll go under video here. So we have 4K. And actually, if we can get, oh, here, here, I think we can go back to 30. So 4K 30 only, no 4K 60 showing up right now. And we do have 8K as well. So here we can jump back to 4K. I'm sorry, no, 4K 60 is showing up. 8K is only 30, uh, but we don't have 4K 120. I think that's also a limitation to the OnePlus 9 that we have, uh, the 9 Pro, I think, overall. Uh, initial impressions, I would probably say easily... Um, I can see what the problems, what could probably be going on. Like I said, initially when I set it up, it did wipe my device. And that was one thing to keep in mind. Uh, installation process of going up to Android 12 is pretty typical to the way we've done it in the past. You download the update directly, the one specifically for your device, and then you need to manually flash it through the update system inside of the smartphone. So you go updates, you go manual, and you go down to local update. 
Um, when you go to Android 12, though, you do need to have a little bit of extra steps in there. Make sure you download the correct files for your device and for your region. There's three separate regions. And then, of course, you also need to download an additional app, which is not part of the installation process, and that's the updater. This version, because it's so close to stock, OnePlus didn't change the code for the update process. So now if I go in there and say update uh, Android, it actually goes through the standard Google Android update. It's not using Oxygen OS updater. So for that reason, you need to download that APK straight from the OnePlus thread. It is linking, links everything in there. I'll, there's a link actually in the description below if you guys were checking it out. I will say, though, this is not going to be a device. This is not going to be a daily driver version. First, the update does wipe your device, which tells us that this is not a this is not meaning an update. This is literally a fresh install. So once you go through that and you set it up and you're using it, you'll notice some of the bugs, some of the concerns, some of the issues, literally the random reboots. So for me, it's been a little bit kind of a hit and miss. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I would say try it on a device you're not using as a daily driver and then to revert. Uh, I'll be doing that, of course, uh, at some point and before I finish the video for Monday. Uh, and then I'll give you guys my opinion as well about how to go back to Android 11 if you want to go back or if you want to stick with Android 12, what are the things you should expect? So hopefully you guys like that. And, and of course, let me know in the comments uh, if there's anything specific you'd like me to focus on on Android 12. Uh, I call it developer preview, even though OnePlus calls it beta. It, in theory, the first released either way for OnePlus devices. Uh, no word yet on other than OnePlus 9 and OnePlus 9 Pro uh, support. Uh, the R is not supported. Uh, the AT is not supported. It literally is only meant for the last two um, models that are internationally supported. And I think that's primarily the main focus. OnePlus wanted to do the beta on devices that were available internationally. The R is not an international version of the OnePlus 9. It's primarily an Indian market uh, version. And the AT was last year's 8 model. So they kept on the 9. So just keep that in mind. So hopefully that gives you guys a, a good under, uh, good reference of where I was coming from. Uh, let me see here. Oh, AM. So here. Um, would you okay? So would you personally go with an S twenty one Ultra or hold off for the Xperia One Mach three? Most important for me is the UI and the media consumption, along with battery life. So I don't really have a much answer on the battery life on the Xperia 1 Mark III yet. I can tell you my experience with the Xperia 1 Mark II, as well as the S21 Ultra, because those are the two comparables to the data that you're looking for. One of them, obviously, is the S21 Ultra. Um, battery on the S21 Ultra, for me, is it's not a great battery life. And I say this because by the end of the day, or at least in, in my days, just to keep reference for both the 1 Mark II and the uh, X21 Ultra, is a 24-hour cycle. I don't judge my day by waking up in the morning and how much battery I have at the end of the day, unless the device dies. That's typically not my re my reference. So, my phone, both the Xperia One and the Xperia uh, and the Xperia One Mark II and the S21 Ultra, for the most part, both survived with extra about 15 to 20 percent left on the battery. The battery life obviously is very respective to the usage. The Xperia One Mark II did not have a 4K 120, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to kind of point that out. I had a 4K 60 frames with an upscaling, which really didn't really play out more than 40, 4K 60. It's a solid 4K 60 uh, display. Battery life on that was decent uh, with the updates that they gave us with Android 11. Uh, and again, full 24 hours, about 20, 15 to 20% left. Uh, and then what I typically do is about 5 a.m. in the morning, I put the phone on the charger, charge it back up, and then once it hits 100, take it off the charger and then literally keep it off the rest of the day. Overnight, everything stays off. Um, periodic, every once in a while, if I get in the car and I'm using Android Auto, those things typically, you know, there is a little bit of a trickle charge there, but not enough to basically bring the phone back to 100%. So sometimes those are factors, but I'm giving you the average the S21 Ultra, for the most part, gives us the same experience. Here's the little bit of a caveat. You're comparing two smartphones that are focused on two different experiences. The OnePlus, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Xperia One Mark II is focused on photography and media consumption. For me, between the two devices, the 4K 120 front-facing speakers and headphone jack is a much better smartphone experience than what you get with the S21 Ultra. Even though we we're getting a 2K display, even if we're getting 120 hertz refresh rate, it's not a 4K panel, and it's not tuned with the uh, basically white balance configuration and movie the uh, basically um, movie mode option built in to get those truly immersive experiences. So for me, that would be a winner for me. The cameras on the back, I think they're definitely more focused on what you can do, pushing yourself, uh, and of course, using the smartphone as an external display is also another big fa factor in there. But then when you talk about an all-rounder, I also want to say that the one S21 Ultra does have a lot of functional things in there as well. The front-facing experience on there is much better. 
Uh, obviously, there's a whole bunch of different things. There's Samsung Dex. There's a whole bunch of other options as well. You lose the headphone jack. You lose some things in there. The stereo speakers for me are good, but they're just not the same experience. They're not both front facing. So there's always going to be in that sense. Uh, at the end, what I would probably say, AM, is it's really going to be that depending on what you're looking for to get out of the smartphone. They're not truly competitors to each other because one is trying to be a, a prosumer camera in the hands of a general user, which is essentially the Xperia 1 Mark III and the Mark II. Uh, but then when you go to the S21, I feel like this year's S21 Ultra is not exactly the same experience. So if, you're, if you've used Samsung in the past and you like the way they look, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, but if you're looking to push your camera capabilities and learn and, and enjoy a little bit more content on your smartphone, I feel like the the, the Xperia 1 Mark II would definitely be the right, uh, and even or the Mark III. I think the Mark III would definitely take the cake. Uh, unfortunately, I just don't have a way of experience or putting them head to head yet. And I'm hoping in the near future we will. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit more is the the things that we've seen in the past, uh, at least what we're starting to see is now videos of the Xperia 1 Mark III are starting to pop up in China. Um, and even actually some uh, other mar uh, other users or other reviewers outside of China start to import these devices to do videos. So we'll have to see. Um, oh, here is Manish is asking, is the Samsung S okay? Um, is the Samsung Galaxy A52 a good phone to buy? I changed uh, my phone. I changed my phone every three to four years. So it's a uh, if it's a good phone. Uh, okay, so. Um, is it so? So is it a good phone uh, in this regard? Also, I like your videos and opinions. I appreciate your uh, support, Manish. Um, the A52 is a mid, so I, I'll say this: Samsung's main primary sellers are the A series. It's not the S series. The S series doesn't sell as much as the A series, and that's primarily because of price. Samsung's priced out everybody for the most part when it comes down to these things, and it literally it appeals to certain users. And I use the S21 Ultra. But I think my approach to this, if I had to change it without necessarily a YouTube a reviewing uh, process, is a little bit hard for me to justify it, even with installment. The A52 in 2021, I think what I'd probably say is it's a decent upgrade and it should be able to carry you for the next few years. You're getting some of the ni nice benefits of the, uh, what we get with this year's upgrades. Uh, the main concern, though, I would, uh, I would probably say is um, if you're thinking of it, of just using it for the next two to three years, there's not going to be that much change as far as the performance that's going to be pushing it. It's probably going to be more on the connectivity side. So as long as you're getting good signal with it and it meets the bands that you have, so it means it supports your local connection speeds, there shouldn't be any issues. And the reality is Samsung does support their devices at least for the first two years with the security patch updates, uh, you know, obviously going in up to three years. So you should be okay. Um, I do need to double check though on the A series if you do get two software updates or is it one? Because if I'm not mistaken, I think it's different for the A series than it is for the S. Um, you don't get DEX, which is unfortunate, but this is something that you want to keep in mind. It only comes to the S series or the Note series. So hopefully that's something in the future that you can consider. But if you've been comfortable before, this should be pretty good, decent experience and at least a good two to two to year experience for you. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, Big Oso is uh, jumping in. TK, should I spend my money on the Asus ROG Phone 5 or go for the Sony Xperia 1 Mark, 5, uh, Mark 3? So here, here is the interesting experience. The RG Phone 5 is a gaming phone. It's a gaming phone first. So the camera experience is not really the heavy focus there. But you are getting a much bigger display, a very nice stereo speakers, a headphone jack with supported with a with a with a quad DAC, with a with a DAC, I'm sorry, not a quad DAC. And um you're getting basically a 6,000 milliampere battery with the dual charging speed. So you're getting very different experiences here, right? It's very focused on that type of experience. Gaming is going to be good. Obviously, uh, you're getting a higher refresh rate on the ROG Phone 5 than you're getting with the Xperia 1 Mark, Mark 3. The main concern, though, that when you start looking at them, if you're doing like kind of head to head, just based on numbers, um, it's not really intended for media consumption in the same level, right? It's not a 4K panel. We're starting to look a different. The price difference between the standard 5 and the 1 Mark 3 at least right now with, with the way we've seen it in China, it's going to be a much bigger uh, bigger jump. If the price isn't an issue for you, then I would probably say you're going to have a better experience with cameras, audio, media consumption on the Xperia 1 Mark III. Gaming, I don't have a way of putting that line. I, I can't draw that line between the two yet. I don't have an experience playing with that. Um, I can tell you that the RG Phone 5 can definitely handle any game that you throw at it. Uh, there are some cooling options for the temperature concerns that the 888 has been uh, can dealing with since launch. Uh, and I think that's one thing I can probably say. Sony hasn't made the official statement saying if the Xperia 1 Mark III has the same cooling uh, mechanism that we have with the Xperia Pro, which seem to have better cooling um, uh, thermal management 
than the Xperia 1 Mark II, primarily because of the 5G ultra wideband modems that they have in there, which is, again, Tony is very specific. Like they, they tackle problems and they tackle them very well, but it's specific to the device for what region is being used. So I would say this, if you're debating between the two, and price isn't an issue because, again, there is a big difference in price or there will be a big difference in price. I'm assuming based on the pricing right now. Um, I think the Xperia 1 Mark III would definitely be a better experience in the long run overall experience because it's promising us that 4K 120 gaming um, and, of course, the ability of using uh, uh, HS power control, which, again, even to this day, ROG or ASUS doesn't have that. Black, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, what is it called? Uh Oh man, the other gaming phone, uh, the Black Shark, not the Black Shark, the Red Magic 6 has um, uh, power separation, which essentially it's HS power control. And that's another feature that I feel like is very beneficial on Sony's side. So you can game for longer periods and not necessarily have to worry about the charging speed. So there are some compromises and pluses on both ends. But if you're focusing heavily on gaming, ROG is going to be your camp. And if you're focusing on all around, focusing on an all around device with great display and great gaming experience, promising. Um, I think the Xperia 1 Mark, Mark III could definitely do the job. So definitely something to consider there. I know it's a long-winded answer, but my hope is that, that it gives you kind of like a good um, a good point of reference. And I'm a little bit behind on comments. I do apologize. Uh, strange, <laughs> strange to X. Good morning, man. Hope you're doing well. Um, uh, Abdelli saying, I totally agree with you. Same improvement, essentially, in the camera department. We also Zoom technology, telephones. I appreciate it, man. El Josa. Uh, oh, here. So I'll just start jumping back saying, um, I'm actually going to go a bit into comparison between the Fuji X100 S uh, F, um, considered to be a quintessential compact st street camera and the main sensor on the Mi 11 Ultra. I think it's a great experience to try to compare it to, to, I mean, so keep in mind, this is one of the largest sensors that we have with the exception of obviously now we have a full one inch sensor on a smartphone. That's a different conversation, but like available for us to play with. I feel like the Mi 11 Ultra is definitely a good experience, a good sensor to, to focus on. Um, I think I would definitely put it against any street photography camera um, on the market. Keep in mind that this is tuned for social media, tuned for online, tuned for those experiences. So if you're trying to do a straight head-to-head -head comparison, I'd recommend you shooting in log. Sorry, shooting in uh, basically raw as opposed to just necessarily shooting uh, in, in standard auto mode. So do the comparison and then try to see also the potential of editing tools uh, that, that can actually be used. Because most photographers or street photographers don't ever use straight the, the images that come straight out of the cameras. They always go and do a little bit of post-processing. So I hope you have an opportunity to be able to try using some tools like that. Let's see here. Uh... Bands are actually most uh, identical between the UK and China. Dude, that is nice. So you, yeah, you get the benefit. 90% of the problems I end up having when I import a Chinese phone is that the bands are out the door. They're not even the GLONASS or I think the, the support for 5G or 4G connectivity is usually down to HSPA+. Plus. So essentially optimize 3G uh, with, a, with a hint of what we can potentially get in 4G. But reality is HSPA is what we get with most... For me, most Chinese phones. Um, I can say that the OnePlus brand, of course, because they're tuned for the US, they work quite well. Uh, for Xiaomi devices, though, on the Mi 11 Ultra, 4G, uh, I think 4G LTE was primarily the best I was able to get. Decent speeds, but it was still the best that I was able to get. Okay, and I think I just did the mistake here, and I think I just skipped 7,000 comments. So let's see here if we can do real quick. Uh, AM, appreciate it, man. Um, Okay, so I think I'm starting to see some interesting question on the S21 Ultra, but let me see if I didn't miss uh, not much, uh, Gary. I think, oh, Gary the Fireman's in there. Hey, man, hope you're doing well. Sam, Sam is in there. Uh, I'll be waiting. Uh, I'll be waiting for more stable versions of Android 12 for OnePlus. Uh, I, I'm with you. I think this is definitely the thing you want to do. You don't want to jump in on this one. This is definitely not the one you should try. I think this is the one you watch other people try so that if it does end up breaking their smartphones, at least somebody else has to deal with it. Um, I was surprised to see that it actually does wipe your smartphone going into it as well as leaving it. So this is a pretty much a clean install regardless of what you're doing. Um, you don't have to literally reset your phone. It does it for you as it's upgrading. But um, there are still potential issues if you don't do things in the right order or install the wrong version on the wrong market that you could technically break your smartphone. So we'll have to keep that in mind. Uh, but definitely be a lookout, be on the lookout for that video on Monday morning. It'll be the first video posted on the channel. Uh, and I think I may end up doing it in both Arabic and in English. Uh, let me see here. Uh, will Sony Xperia 1 Mark III launch in the USA before September? Um, actually, so here, this is the interesting approach. They promised us summer. 
right? So summer could potentially be all the way up till August, which is kind of weird if you think about it. Uh, but the reality is more than likely we should be able to see it. Now that we see, now that we know it's in China, right? So beginning of June, it's in China. There's a good chance that more than likely by probably mid next month, maybe if, if, if timing is, if they follow last year's, uh, I would say schedule, Europe will more than likely get it before us and we will probably be the last market. Uh, now, they kept it vague specifically. I don't know if Sony is going to be impacted by the chip shortage. Obviously, they weren't impacted to be able to release it in China. So there's things to be keep, kept in mind there. So they're obviously still able to produce some of these devices. I'm not sure if it's uh, the quantity that's going to be basically the biggest concern. So. Uh, will it come out before September? More than likely, as they did promise us a summer release and they haven't updated that, that, that target market uh, date. So that would be my goal. And that's what I'm shooting for as well. I would love to be able to get my hands on it. Um, look out for uh, more than likely specials and feature uh, like combo deals that they end up doing every time they do a pre-sale. And that typically uh, will, uh, the best way to say that it helps uh, helps with the price. <laughs> Let's just say that it he definitely helps with the price, regardless of what it ends up being. Uh, let me see here. Uh, oh, Greg is in there, of course. Uh, Gary, hey, man. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to catch up. Okay, I saw Greg's doing well. Uh, it's Saturday. <laughs> All right with the world. I love Gary. Gary, Gary, the man. Hashtag, the, hashtag Gary, the fireman. That's what we should start uh, starting up with the show. Uh, let me see here. Okay, now I'm starting to see. Have you tried the uh, Unihertz QWERTY keyboard smartphone? Okay, so I've heard of the brand, uh, Andrew, but I haven't had a chance to check them out. I'll say that um, if I'm not mistaken with the actual uh, brand itself, they reached out. Um, this is a little bit of a BTS, to, uh, you know, behind the scene kind of stuff. Um, and I don't know why I always have to kind of caveat BTS as in behind the scenes because there is a beat, you know, anyways, it's not the BTS team that we're talking about. Anyways, um, they did reach out that I think they were trying to reach out for some coverage over on XDA and I wasn't, that wasn't part of my thing. So I forwarded them over to XDA and I think I'm not sure something, what ended up going on at that point, but I wasn't able to try to work out with them. I did reach out afterwards asking, Hey, do you want to Janet, send me a unit? Cause I saw Adam's email, uh, videos and, and coverage on them. Um, I was very intrigued at the time, uh, and I would have loved to work with them directly, but the team had a specific market and I feel like Adam has been doing a lot of BlackBerry stuff. So they felt like it was maybe, maybe a better uh, fit for him. And obviously that he did a great job. So uh, I have not, hopefully I will. Uh, but if you are looking for some coverage, obviously I'm, I'm sure Ad Andrew knows all of that. Um, Adam from uh, tech Odyssey has definitely done a lot of great work for them for covering the device. Uh, Stranger X is uh, TK. If you have, if you have the option to create a smartphone, let's say a dream phone, a dream phone, what would what would the specs be for this phone? Um, I've always this is obviously a very it, I mean, the reality is it'll be a mishmash of a whole bunch of different things. Uh, but if I had to kind of put a list of smartphone features that I would love to see on a, the features that I would love to see on a smartphone. With what we have currently on the market, so meaning I can technically pick from any type of technology that's already been provenly available, uh, I would probably say is Sony Xperia 5 Mach 3 body, or even Mach 2, because for the most part, I think they look the same. Uh, so a 4K panel with a longer form factor. Uh, I definitely would want a 5G connectivity. Uh, I would love to have, obviously, a headphone jack stay there with the quad DAC. So definitely, you know, things that we typically see from, uh, uh, you know, obviously, if what we saw from LG and what we see from Sony. Um, I'd love to be able to see a more focus on the smartphone's uh, gaming capabilities, adding some triggers on the side on top of the fact of giving us that 4K 120 hertz refresh rate. So 4K 120 hertz, uh, at least a 5,000 milliampere battery. Uh, I like the 33 watt charging and I know what Sony's trying to do with the battery uh, health and, and, and of course extended battery life. Uh, but my goal would probably say is a 5,000 milliampere battery with somewhere close to that, maybe 40 or 50 watt charging with better management to charging speeds. And what I mean by this is, um, if you've ever, if you guys are familiar with Teslas or with with uh, supercharging or charging capabilities, um, charging your car is truly dependent on the charger and the actual device itself. So it doesn't always charge at 65 watts for like a OnePlus device, or it doesn't charge at 50 watts or 33 watts. It's a curve. It's a bell curve, right? Starts off slow a little bit and then speeds up in the middle and goes all the way. I hits peak around 50 to 70 percent, and then from there on starts tipping down. So it's always a curve. I would hope to see something like that with better management from Sony. But again, things like that on that smartphone. Um, as far as the processor, which is a little bit different for me, I honestly would opt to go with the 865 over the 888 this time, mostly because of uh, because of thermal management and it, because of the 5G modem being still very capable, but independent from the smartphone. So it's a different tech experience, although 
if there was ever a, a dream 888 plus that fixes the heat uh, concern with the 888 and still gives us the benefit of the triple isp and the benefits that we get with this year's um you know improved performance and core uh, processing power that we get with the 888 that would be my uh, my, my ideal the dream there um, something like a Dex experience built into this with 12 gigs of RAM and about you know 256 gigs of internal storage and an SD card. So it sounds like it's a lot, but I feel like Sony is hitting almost all of those to a certain extent, uh, with the exception of a few things when it comes down to charging. But I think those are realistic. Uh, Android 11, of course, at this point, since it's more stable than Android 12. Um, and of course, the camera experience, I would love to be able to have 4K60 all around. All the sensors should give us 4K60 with autofocus. And of course, the ability of shooting 8K or even 4K 120. So a little bit of a long list, but a lot of it kind of is literally based off the Xperia 1 Mark III, but we'll have to see how that kind of comes up. So hopefully that, that gave you the answer you're looking for. Um, would well, like, that was a long answer, but yeah. Um, oh, okay. So here, um, Akshat is asking is, does the carry support uh, suck with the Xperia 1 Mark II? Uh, will that be a problem for the Xperia 1 Mark III? So, okay, sorry, this carry support right now sucks. So what we saw in the US, at least in 2020, Sony did not want to try to approach trying to figure out the different flavors of 5G in the US, right? We have T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon. At that time, we still had uh, Sprint. We had different 5Gs. We had different technologies for 5G going on everywhere. We have ultra wideband, which primarily was a Verizon thing. And then we start seeing AT&T and T-Mobile trying to have them in specific markets. So their approach was very specifically clear. We're going to cover 4G LTE for everything. So they did go with that. Uh, and again, it was a hit and miss depending on where you, which carrier you got. The Xperia Pro that did come out early this year does support 5G, but it only supports a Verizon 5G. So sub six and ultra wideband on Verizon. The Xperia 1 Mark III is the it does come in with that fix. They are supporting, from what we understand, is that it's going to support 5G in the US and it is going to be a sub six technology type of 5G. So no ultra wideband version yet. Maybe they'll have a special version made for Verizon. I don't know. They're not selling it through the carriers, they're selling them independently. So you have to keep in mind till it's sold through Verizon that it then makes sense. So more than likely, yes, the problem should be fixed. 5G should be better. 5G sub-6 is readily available on almost all markets now. So anywhere you're able to get signal, you should be able to start seeing 5G as uh, carriers are starting to replace and upgrade their towers to include 5G uh, antenna bands. So I think that's going to be a good solution for us to, to be able to expect from Sony. Um, a little bit, I feel like it's about a year late, but I think they chose the best approach for the best experience they could provide. So I'm not justifying it, but I'm saying that I understand. Hopefully that makes sense. But thank you, uh, Akash, for asking that question. It sounds like you're in the US market as well. So you're not going to be in the same boat uh, checking out the Xperia 1 Mark III. Um, so here, Greg's jumping back with, I'll tell you guys that Android 12 beta one on my Pixel 4 XL, uh, battery life has increased definitely all day to an all day experience. So that's that's very good. I, I didn't get a chance to check it out on my Pixel 4 XL. I kept it on the Pixel 4a primarily. I wanted to see the lowest common denominator, see how that performs. Um, so for, you know, it should be able to run really good. I think Gary, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Gary the Fireman installed it on this Pixel 4 XL as well. Um, TK, has the Android 12 beta for the Tesla been released yet? Uh, the beta has not, but the alpha is definitely cooking. I, I would probably say that. Uh, I would love to be able to get Android 12 running on my Tesla. Um, speaking of Tesla updates, since you're referring to Android 12, it's actually version 11. There's been some leaks with... Um, and not see you got me saying it, DT. You're gonna mess with me. You're gonna get some uh, some uh, Tesla followers like, what is he talking about? Android 12? No, no. Um, so the the brand new Model S played um, is supposed to be coming out, which they're gonna have their announcement and, and their their launch event. Um, is showcasing uh, a version 11 uh, dashboard or UI uh, interface for Tesla devices, so Tesla cars. So I'm hoping, obviously, that more cars are going to be starting to get that. So that's the one that's currently being tested uh, for Tesla cars. Unfortunately, not Android-based. I'm hoping and still very, very much hoping that it is much better optimized for the processors that we have with the infotainment system on Teslas, as it typically ends up being a little bit slow. Not the standard UI. I'm not talking about switching on the fan or turning on the AC and stuff like that. I'm talking about the entertainment system. You know, opening YouTube, which essentially is a full is a full page browser page, um, it takes literally almost 20 seconds for it to load. And it just on a car that is just all about speed, 
just kills. So yeah, uh, I'm hoping the new version is definitely going to be coming up soon and uh, we'll be able to check it out uh, as well as whatever the uh, upgrades that they're talking about full self-driving uh, at that point. Um, Oh, yeah, so Aditya is not to mention that the S21 Ultra has a beautiful display while the Xperia 1 Mark II has a dim screen, uh, not ideal for, uh, for yeah, for uh, for vlogging, so uh, viewing uh, under sunlight. The Xperia 1 Mark II did have some concerns regarding the, that display, and it's highly intended because of the fact they couldn't get the brightness level on it with a 4K panel. There's that technology that starts kind of working. Um, Sony is is using a very cutting edge, uh, you know, higher resolution displays, uh, where Samsung's definitely has basically literally invented the edge when it comes down to uh, bleeding edge type of technology when you know using your smartphones outdoors uh, i think oneplus also does a really decent job on this uh, the oneplus 9 here with the android 12 update although kind of looks like it's running a good uh, brightness it actually the brightness level is almost broken on it because it keeps staying at almost high uh, but it does have some nice options in there and hopefully it doesn't keep crashing on me it booted up at least one time since we started so yeah aditya is definitely making a good good point here um, on that one um uh let me see here what else we have here uh oh chris lopez is back hey man hey tk good afternoon uh does the note 10 plus have the headphone jack um i forgot no uh none of the i think the note um Okay, you know what? I take that back. Uh, I want to say, I don't remember. I want. I, I do want to say that the Note 10 was the the first series that they dropped. Um, okay, so Note 10 Plus. I want to say maybe that. Uh, okay, let's see here real quick. I actually, have a headphone jack. No, no, you didn't. You didn't need to end up picking up the adapter. So, yeah, no, Chris, sorry. Um, it, it, I, I had to think about that specifically because I had the Note 10 Plus, and I sold the Note 10 Plus, and I, I think we kept the Note 10 for my wife at the time. Uh, but I remember that the S10 was literally it was known for it being the last series, last phone series from Samsung to ever have a headphone jack. And I'm talking about the S and Note series, not not the A series. A series is very different. The mid range, for some reason, has kept that for, kept that as a feature for some time. So yeah, I know for sure. Uh, anytime, AM, uh, I appreciate that, of course. Uh, Golan Lavi is asking. Oh, no, let's see real quick here. Hey, TK. Uh, how, uh, sorry, uh, how much the recent updates on the OnePlus 9 Pro improved the camera? Uh, the improvements that they've done has been to fix issues with uh, basically color processing. And I think so, I'll say this. From launch to now, the cameras have, a much, have, have improved quite a bit. Uh, 4K 120 for me works, although there's a little bit of hiccups every once in a while. I took it out with me last week when we went to the theme park here in the, um, the uh, near us. And um, I think overall 4K 60 looks pretty good. Front-facing camera still needs a little bit of work. HDR processing a little bit hard, especially with uh, bright days when there's a lot of um, overexposed background behind the subject. It just tends to basically focus on you and it blows everything back out. Uh, so the other thing that would probably say on the rear sensors though the cameras have definitely gotten a lot better uh, software has been good uh, consistent upgrades and pushing new features into the camera that 4k 120 looks really good so uh, has it is it basically better than other cameras it's hard for me to justify i wasn't really doing a comparison but it definitely did improve the experience overall and the color calibration on the main sensors in the back um, and i liked again uh, the one 4k 120 for me was at the theme park, you know, watching roller coasters. Um, it, I'm, I'm actually kind of working up to a video doing the the three months after three months OnePlus Nine Pro uh, and the upgrades and so on that we've seen. So I'm definitely very impressed with it, and it has improved a lot. So if you've used it or you're thinking about getting it, uh, it definitely keeps getting better. Uh, OnePlus is very much focused on making that experience very good. Uh, not, I would say, not as as a night and day of experience upgrade from the Eight Pro, uh, but definitely a Seven Pro massive jump from what we got back then uh greg greg saying it's like i can't wait for the pixel 6 I, you know you and me both man uh the pixel 6 uh, we which surprisingly the, the the rumors kind of like tampered off we saw some i think there was one more post this week that i saw where it talked about a case you know uh, authenticating the design uh, the, uh, the design decision that they're going with um, I will say this though, we are in June and we are still no word, no, no inclination of where the Pixel 5a is coming in, uh, which we should have heard something by now. 
So we'll have to see. But uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens soon. We saw the brand new Pixel Buds, the Pixel A, the Pixel Buds A, which essentially is a cheaper, more budget-friendly version than the Pixel Buds that we saw last year announced. So, so you know, Pixel or Google is starting to, it looks like they're going to ramp up some announcements. Uh, they're just trickling them uh, ever so slowly. And uh, it seems like at least, if anything, if the Pixel 5A does come out, it's going to be on its own independent launch thing, and it'll be available probably uh, before, obviously, uh, you know, the announcement of the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro. Um, for the camera, I do either OnePlus or Sony and uh, Pixel. I, I, I'm with you. Uh, OnePlus has been definitely really good. Sony, for sure, and Pixel, absolutely, hands down. Google's been doing a great job with that. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. I've got a little bit of water. Okay. Uh, okay. So, guys, I will definitely probably recommend, if anything, please uh, make sure that you're only commenting once and don't try to spam the the the, um, the chat with multiple, you know, posting the question multiple time right after each other. I, I do. Uh, I realize that every once in a while. Um, uh, that sometimes I don't get the, the question because depending on how the stream is coming up on my end. Uh, but if you don't see me answer the question after some time, obviously you're more than welcome to post it again, but don't try to post it multiple times to catch. But I did notice uh, at least one person here, um, often a bit pale, especially in low light conditions. Uh, so here, Celestia's fa Celestia family is asking regarding the S21 Ultra camera experience and it looks specifically in auto mode. So meaning if you turn it on and you just start shooting content, um, my first question would say here, Celestia, is uh, two things. Uh, what version, sorry, uh, what mode are you using for the camera? Are you using the stabilized video or are you using the standard uh, video? Also, are you using it in 10, 1080, 4K, or, what you are, or if you're going to 8K? Uh, the resolution and the softness in the image in low light, most cameras are going to lose quality. Uh, very f because of the size of the sensor and of course also what the sensor what the camera and the smartphone is trying to do to stabilize so essentially is they're trying to get more detail to push the light so for typically what they do is they bump up the iso so bump the iso typically includes some basically artifacts and it reduces the quality and creates those um i would probably the skin tones that you're looking for so when you say low light it's it's respective to the environment that you're in and if it's too low the camera just has to compensate otherwise you'll get a very darker image and it won't be usable so just keep in mind some of those elements when you're looking in the camera uh, i do recommend turning off any kind of stabilization when you're doing low light also if you're trying to use it um, trying to go with the highest quality image with the most amount of light uh, that you're able to get natural light so to, to get the subject illuminated so the smartphone doesn't do have, have to do a lot of the work for it uh, but as far as the experience uh, we would need to know a little bit more of the other environments uh, but it is not uncommon for a smartphone camera to um, lose quality as you get into uh, you know with low light it, the the low light situation when you're talking about non full sensors like an, an DSLR or you know a crop sensor uh, we're even talking about you know the micro you know depending on the sensor that you have on the S21 or which one you're using you're going to get a very tailored experience so i hope that makes sense um AM, uh, anytime, man. AM, of course. Sebastian Lobos, hey, man. How you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, let me see here. I think I'm starting to catch up. I hope. Are you? Okay, this thing just died. It does that all the time. It does that, uh, Mr. Fusion. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm missing a specific joke that I apparently I'm just a little bit late to the comment for that one. Uh, let me see here. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I I can see that Celestia is uh, you're you're posting the same question multiple times. Let me see here. Aditya. Da, da, da. Oh, Dominic Wan is in the chat. Hey man, how you doing? Um, it's, it's replaced with an old uh, uh, glued in like like most most. I get that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Fat Produce is jumping in. I'm going to get it. Uh, I'm going to get the opposite of a Tesla. I'm going to get the car that the that it's powered by crude oil. <laughs> you're not even going to get it processed, right? You're just not even. You're just going to go with straight pumping it straight from the ground into the actual tank, and you're going to be running it. Uh, I get it. No, no, I know. Um, it, you know, it's it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Um, uh, prices prices of gas, especially with, with what's been going on over the on the East Coast with the prices going up and so on. It was definitely nice to have a, a solution that did not necessarily rely on me going to the station and paying four fifty. And keep in mind, California is just bad when it comes down to pricing. Not because we 
uh, the price of gas is, gas is not much higher. I mean, obviously, there is a certain number of increases coming in depending on how long it has to be transported to us. But we have taxes upon taxes upon taxes added on top of our gas pricing that increases our pricing to be somewhere north of $4. So at the most, last during the last few weeks when prices were super, super high, uh, we were showing about $4.50 to $4.60 a gallon, and that's a lot. So not having to go fill up gas was definitely a plus for me. Um, I did learn a few things that there are some areas here, uh, some places that give you free electric charging. So as long as I'm like shopping at grocery stores, like um, Whole Foods here uh, in the area as well has free uh, electric car charging when you're there. So you park your car in a specific spot, you plug it in, and then you go in there and do your shopping. You come back and you get about 10 to 12 more miles added to your car. So in reality, they're, they're starting to put more things in the environment, uh, in the areas for us to incentivize us to go with electric. Um, it's still not going to be my choice for traveling if I want to go very far. Obviously, there's going to be some things to keep in mind, uh, mostly because that downtime and having to find superchargers and so on. Although, for the record, Tesla has the best supercharging network as well as the ability of using standard uh, electric charging uh, stations networks. That's one of the main benefits. When you start looking at other cars on the market, let's say the, the four, the Mach-E or some of the other options on the market, you have to very much rely on the standard market chargers um, to basically build up your decision. So based on where you live, um, I think I want to say uh, Greggles TV, Greg bought a car in San Diego um, and I think he went with a Kia. So his experience is going to be very different than mine. I can go charge at every single station as well as the, uh, the standard EV charging stations, but his experience is going to be limited to where those are. And he did talk about uh, uh, you know, possibly getting a charger at home. That's going to be also another thing that a lot of people don't talk about. Getting a Tesla without getting a home charger doesn't make sense. You should, and if you are thinking about getting a Tesla or any kind of electric vehicle, get the home charger as well. That's going to be your home base. You go and you come and go all the time. Your home is always going to be your base. Um, and you're able to get some benefits as well from having your car charged up every morning when you're leaving. You'd never have to worry about a gas station. So those are some of the things you keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, uh, congrats on the on the crude oil, on, on the first, uh, the world's first crude oil car. Uh, I, we definitely can do a, a, a driving trip where we meet halfway and see which one of us makes it on the full range. <laughs> Oh man, Andrew and I've been been talking off uh, offline for some time, so always nice to to chat. Um, I love it. I love it there. Uh, let me see here. Fat flux capacity, <laughs> Mister Fusion. I like that one. Oh man. Uh, oh, uh, Rani uh, Rani Agun. Hopefully, I'm saying that uh, Agum. Uh, no, Agun. Hopefully, I'm saying that. Um, making a photo, uh, making a phone for enthusiasts and for the general public are totally different things. Sony mar Sony marks uh, are for very well, very very specific enthusiasts. OnePlus uh, for mass enthusiasts, and Samsung's for the general public. I, I'll say, I'll, I'll say that to a certain point, I think you have a you make a perfect sense. Yes, Sony very much feeds into a specific niche market. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be a cup of same cup of tea for everybody, right? Not everybody's going to like Sony. Not everybody's going to think what they want. The features that I was talking about a few a few minutes ago are very much a super high top of the line enthusiast level experience. This is the wish list of all wish lists, right? If I had to put on a paper what what I would like my phone to have and to do. Those are the things I would like to do. And that wasn't even talking about software capabilities. We were still talking about, factly, uh, mostly just um, hardware stuff, right? I mean, I would love to have Google's uh, image processing built in on top of Sony's optics to be able to get the best experience. So those are things that I always look for. Um, I'm not sure on when it comes down to Samsung, if Samsung's making phones for the general public, or is it just making phones to a certain experience that they deem is the right answer with borrowing a lot of experiences from other manufacturers. So Sony is Sony. Uh, and when we talk about OnePlus, OnePlus has learned a lot. They've improved a lot. They've uh, diversified now where basically they're bridging a little bit more with Oppo. They're learning a lot of, uh, from the, from Oppo. Again, both of them being a BB, BBK, uh, so they're, they're both under the BBK umbrella, I would say. So they're learning from each other. And those that that's actually a very big benefit for us. So that's one thing for OnePlus. And OnePlus is building upwards. And they have a very good solid experience in the mid-range. The Nord line, the OnePlus 9, and the 9 Pro are definitely very strong contenders. Although we're starting to see their primary shooters, or primary devices like the 9 and 9 Pro, probably in the future, with the 10 and the 10 Pro, uh, they're becoming more flagship-based. Samsung in the A series, I think your answer is right. It is more for the for 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 the general public and general consumers. The S series, 
that's debatable. I feel like S series has been doing some interesting co uh, compromises, although it may fit the bill, meaning the S21 and the S21 plus look great on paper and performance. You as a user using that smartphone for an extending amount of time will start to see some of those compromises being done. You're paying $800, $900 for a phone that's made out of plastic, considered to be a flagship, but the experience just doesn't match that exactly. Uh, features have been taken out. 1080p has been capped now. We no longer have to QHD as we used to have with the S20 series. So again, A series for sure. OnePlus is doing great and Sony is, is holding up on its own, I think for sure. Uh, so I, I'm not necessarily... Uh, disagreeing there i'm just more like elaborating my view of that uh, that list and to a certain point uh you should do what you do well and keep doing it um sony's promising us an experience that is pretty much building on the one and the one mark ii and i like where they're going that's why i appreciate it and because we don't have lg in 2021 they're literally the only player is there going to be other options are they going to change next year we'll have to wait and see but i hope that they keep doubling on this Having this type of premium uh, quality experience on a smartphone needs to exist for even if it's just for the sake of the option to be available, but it is really needed where we are starting to see more things being taken out and more prices going up. Sony's doing it in the right way. They're giving you more. I mean, they're asking more. I'm not going to take that away, but they're giving you more and they're giving you more good things, quality things. So I just want them to update the uh, the sensor on the front facing camera. I hope they do that next year. Uh, Pixel 6, I think, will be over $1,000. Uh, <laughs> I, I like how Chris just, he just drops that there. He's like, Pixel 6, $1,000 plus. Have fun. So it's a debatable concept, right? I say debatable only because we don't know the pricing, but because we also know that there's going to be a 6 Pro, which obviously will be more expensive. So if the 6 is at 1,000, then the 6 Pro is definitely out of reach for anybody. Um, Depends on how white like end up being perform end up performing, and why I say that because we don't really we haven't heard much other than some rumors and information. Basically, potentially white, uh, not white like sorry, a white chapel, uh, white chapel becoming uh, not exactly a competitor to the 888, but something around that price, which kind of begs the question to be: Would they necessarily go out their first time releasing their first SOC, uh, their collaboration with Samsung, you know, putting it out? Is it really going to be justified to try to jump and just basically say, hey? This is new. This is ours. This is us uh, controlling everything, but we're going to charge you $1,000 plus. I'm not sure. Last year's biggest focus that Sony, sorry, that uh, Pixel did and they announced it during their Pixel uh, team Pixel meetups that we had last year was the Pixel 5 was a specific designed price point feature set processor to meet the price point. They realized that they were overpricing their smartphones and they wanted to fix that. They saw the success, they saw the adoption, they saw how many pixels they were able to sell. It sounds ironic, it's like they're selling pixels, but anyways, you you, you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, for them to go back and flip the, flip the coin and say, well, wait a minute, you liked us so much last year, we're going to go to 1,000, is far-fetched. I think more than likely we're going to be somewhere between the 600, you know, 699 to maybe 899, somewhere like that, uh, depending on the model that you're going and the storage capacity. I don't really see them jumping that much. I don't foresee the improvements that they're offering, at least on paper with the leaks that we've seen, are going to justify that much of an experience change. Android 12 is not that much dramatically updated other than the UI elements and the camera experience that they're trying to offer on the 6 or the 6 Pro are going to have to justify themselves. So we'll have to see. Uh, potential, could they? Yes, absolutely. Uh, will they? That's a question we'll have to wait a little bit more to answer. And I hope we'll be able to see that as well. Um, Joey B is in there as well. Greetings, TK, Davin, DTA. Oh, Davin Davis. Hey, man. Hope you're doing well. Uh, uh, Gary and everybody in the chat as well. Sorry, I didn't see J Davin is in there. Uh, Vedanta is in there. Good morning. How you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, man, hope you guys are doing great. I am, <laughs> I am, I think I am, I'm behind. What time is it? Yow. Okay. Okay. I'm very, very late. Um, Hope I see this right. Pixel 6 Pro, I think, will be over. <laughs> Chris is just messing. Yes, Chris. I think there's a possibility it could be over $1,000. You're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, Mr. Axel, uh, Axel PL. Hey, man. Good morning. Uh, when will Oxygen One be officially available on the OnePlus 6? So that's a great question. So here, it, this is typical to what we've seen in the past, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's going to be a uh, situation. So if I'm not mistaken, 
Android uh, Pixel 6, sorry, the, the OnePlus 6, more than likely only had two software updates. So 10 and 11 were going to be the maximum they were going to get. Um, officially, I'm not 100% sure if Android 12 will be coming to the Pixel 6. More than likely, it's going to end up having to be somewhere of a custom ROM. But I, I don't want you to hold me to this because it's just generally not part of the, what... Um, uh, I say OnePlus typically promises the software version updates. So we're at Pixel 9 right now. 2020 was Pixel uh, Pixel 8, uh, sorry, OnePlus, sorry, OnePlus 9. OnePlus 8 was 2020. OnePlus uh, 7 was 2019. OnePlus 6 was 2018. So that's four years ago. I'm not 100% sure, but I would almost be tempted to say officially, unfortunately, I don't think it's coming to the 6. 7 is a stretch, but I think the 8 and the, uh, I mean, we know that the 8 and the 11, the 8 and the 9 are going to get it because they're the two last generations and could potentially come into uh, OnePlus 7 as well. Uh, but we'll have to see how things go. 6, I may end up being a little bit more on the extended life. Uh, and again, custom ROMs will more than likely be helpful. So XTA for sure. Uh, I don't know if you have yours uh, you know, unlocked or not. Uh, so actually, so, uh, Vedanta is asking for a good uh, budget price, friendly, uh, headphones for India, general headphones for me, I would probably say realistically one plus for me do typically very well, especially the Bud Z, uh, latency, battery life and audio performance were pretty decent. The microphones that we had them were really good. Haven't seen another upgrade to them since then, but my only experience, I would probably say, uh, typically those type of series of headphones, uh, sound core is also pretty decent when it comes down to audio experience. Uh, tick watch, uh, not tick watch, the tick pods, not the pro, but the tick pods too, did also do a pretty decent job. So I think those are generally available in most markets. So hopefully one of these will fit what you're looking for. But my concern would always be uh, just what you're using them for. If you're using them just for listening to music and making phone calls, uh, then these will typically do well. Gaming is a very different beast because when you start talking about gaming and, and headphones, um, it's going to be a little bit hard, especially when you're talking about budget, because uh, they typically drop the latency. The latency is super bad on the lower end. And even if you do get low latency options, those typically get start sh you know, shooting up in price. The wireless Buds Z, though, uh, from OnePlus, with OnePlus smartphones, typically do well with Fanatic mode or gaming mode now turned on. Let me see else we have here. Uh, Earl Owens. Hey, man. How you doing? Um, hey, TK. Just watched the Sony Xperia 1 Mark III unboxing. This phone is my third child. Yes. Um, I've been I've been oohing and eyeing on all of these videos uh, literally posted. So we've seen a few videos. Uh, there's, I think, one I'm, I'm tempted to say that's probably the one you saw, the one with the gray uh, Xperia 1 Mark III with that kickstand case that they had. Um, I think, no, don't get me wrong. I, it, the aesthetics of the uh, the Xperia 1 Mark II are very much mirrored in the Xperia 1 Mark III. Very, very much. Uh, to a certain point, uh, what I mean by this, um, you'd be hard-pressed to figure out if this is an Xperia 1 Mark II or an Xperia 1 Mark III if I kept doing this, other than the fact that if you see a reflection, then you know it's the three, the two. And if you see that matte finish, the new matte finish that they're talking about, you'll see the uh, you'll definitely get the better experience there. So let me see here real quick. I'm getting some notifications here. I'm hoping... Ooh. Okay. So I need to... <laughs> I'm going to hate this. Guys, I'm going to have to do a 30-second, um, uh, well, actually, hold on. Yeah, let me see if we can do this here. Burr, burr, burr. Uh, okay, I'm going to need a 30-second countdown, and I will be right back. I think there's a package at the door. Okay, do apologize for this. <laughs> I I normally don't like doing this. Um, <laughs> I wish it was a thirty eighty Ti. No, I don't. I I don't. I don't have any. <sighs> don't get me started on the on the on the thirty eighty Ti, man. Seriously. Uh, no. It, well, 
Okay, so if you guys were watching the show on Wednesday, uh, on not Wednesday, what's it called? On Thursday night, um, I mentioned during the show with Juan Carlos is I was able to actually uh, basically secure a um, 5950X, an AMD uh, Ryzen uh, 5950X CPU that I was able to secure. And it's being, it's in the process of being delivered. So I was hoping that that was the package. Uh, unfortunately, this is not that package, but this is the cooler that came for that pa for that CPU. I ended up picking up a Corsair um Q, I think it's the IQ, uh, the the triple, the 360 millimeter fan uh, set up on it to basically wa uh, water, basically an AIO cooler for my CPU that's coming in. The current CPU that I have is a 3900X that comes with an air cooler, but I don't feel like it's going to be enough for overclocking it since I want to start pushing some uh, so the limits a little bit with that one. It's a much more pro uh, powerful processor than the 3900X, but yeah, I, I was hoping that that's what it was, and it turned out to be something else. But I'm sorry for building up everybody's <laughs> hopes on, on that one. Um, I am I am in the process. I'm okay, I'm I am hopelessly trying to get my hands on a 3080 Ti. I'll say that. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I had a I had zero luck getting it on the 3080 uh, standard. The 3080 Ti is even worse because the the moment it comes up, it's just, it's gone. So um, the launch event that they had with Best Buy with the early access uh, in, in my area, they only had it in one specific store in LA and it was in downtown LA, which was about 45 to an hour away. It was so far and I would have to have been there two days in advance standing in line to be able to try to get my hands on one that it just wasn't worth it. Uh, the New X Shuffle is just a joke um, to, a, to, to the most expand, extent because it just never works. There's no rhyme or reason how and how many pieces they have and how many how many people they could have literally one unit of something and they're having thousands of people there's hundreds and thousands of people signing up and it never works and I've been doing it for the last two months and not once have I won anything not it's not like I'm getting an option and just rejecting it um, but I do I do apologize for having that little bit of a jump out and coming back I was hoping it would be 30 seconds it took me a little bit longer uh, lobby music while we wait TKs. <laughs> <laughs> you spoil us, uh, my friend. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, but again, I do. I really would have hoped that this would be, was the 3080 Ti. Um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Live unboxing, Tim. Uh, no, uh, seriously, guys. If, if it wasn't, um, I mean, I, I'll show you the cooler. It's it's not seriously. It's, so it's an Amazon box, not nothing special. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm I'm, I'm hiding it. Uh, but literally, it is just a Corsair cooler for the 5950X. Unfortunately, the 5950X is not here yet. Let's see what we have. Again, typical Amazon, massive box. Yeah, so we'll put that on the side. So, but yeah, here you go. <laughs> It is the IQ Elite, uh, uh, the H150i Elite, uh, basically, Capelex, Capelex, hopefully I'm saying that correct. Uh, we have a triple fan RGB with uh, a nice little header there, water cooling AIO with IQ. Now, IQ is Corsair's um, RGB controller, which coincidentally is what I have on my PC. So I'm not, I may not necessarily need to install an extra one. Um, I'm hoping I have enough headers open on the existing one uh, because I already use them uh, to be able to manage the fans on my system. So we'll have to see. Vin, um, <laughs> that I appreciate it, man. So the 3080 Ti call, uh, cost almost as much as the 6900 XT, which realistically, I feel like the 3080 Ti was pushed out or released specifically to uh, compete with the 6900 XT because the 6900 XT was beating the 3080, but not beating the 3090, which is also a little bit of a decision there in the UK. I'm going to get the 6900 XT instead because they are a lot easier to find here in the UK. Um, I'm imagining they're a little bit easier as well in the US. For me, though, my biggest thing, and it's not that I'm, I mean, I am team NVIDIA. So I've been using NVIDIA GPUs for years. It's not that I've never used AMDs. The last time I used an AMD GPU was a long, long time ago. It was a separate generation. It wasn't even close to what they offer now. I realized the 6900 XD is definitely a much better, uh, pro, you know, a GPU from what we're able to get. Uh, I rely heavily on uh, NVIDIA's uh, optimization for uh, Adobe Premiere and, Adobe, and of course the DLSS and the games that I like to play. So that's primarily what I've been stuck with. Now, don't get me wrong. The other thing that I'm also trying to keep in mind here is 
whatever I upgrade on my system for my personal use will end up being basically an upgrade for my son's system that I'm also building on the side. So those are the things I'm looking into. So where the 3900X would make perfect sense to work on my son's PC, uh, uh, it, uh, but it does need to basically use a good cooler. So that's why I can't use the, uh, the I say that the standard cooler that comes with the 3900X. So for me, I need to basically switch over to an AIO on the 5950X. Again, my goal is to try to overclock it, and that's going to be one of the best solutions on the market. I've used Corsair's brand of coolers for some time, although the last one I had did fail, uh, but it still does a decent job for me. It does a great job for what I needed from it. Uh, but congrats. Yes, the 6900 XT is going to be definitely very, very nice. Um, Rahi's, Rahi Ahudun is saying, is a quick question here. So Sony's biggest weakness uh, isn't the price, uh, isn't its price point. It's the supply and distribution channels. Certain people are interested to buy unique phones, but getting uh, getting a Sony uh, to bot is most, it's, it's not available in most regions. So yes, absolutely. Uh, Sony's, Sony's I, I would have to say that it, between Sony and LG's uh, availability and uh, and marketing uh, strategies, those have been very interesting because it seems like they're working to a specific beat, meaning they're really shooting for a specific experience and they're not really focusing on everything. Like they're not trying to be number one right now. They're slowly but surely focusing on their marketing. They're focusing on releasing smartphones and making them more available. But they're also being realistic in their deployment of smartphones. They're not trying to produce a million units expecting to sell only 200. They're being realistic. So... Um, where they used to be available in, in a lot more markets in the uh, internationally at one point, and they regressed to a smaller market, they're slowly but surely coming back. Uh, kind of like how Pixel is slowly expanding. I think Samsung and uh, sorry, Sony is definitely doing so as well. But it is sometimes hard in the U.S. I've, I mean, I'm not happy about it, but I realize and accept the fact that. Sony devices are going to be available last uh, when it comes down to announcement or deployment. We saw that last year. We saw that the year before. Uh, we saw that, you know, uh, we saw, you know, the Xperia 1 Mark II came in here almost at the end of July, where uh, in the EU, they had it early July, late June. So all my brethren in UK were playing with not only that, they also had nice colors. Um, they were playing with their devices before we were able to. So uh, it's hard. It's Yeah, it is definitely a tough approach. Uh, it is uh, definitely Sony's uh, prerogative to be able to kind of put it in the way that, you know, uh, they're releasing uh, devices and marketing uh, on their own uh, cycle. But again, with the Xperia 1 Mark III, it's, it's selling in China before it even sells in Japan. And then, or even Europe or any other market. So, so we're starting to see some content on it. I'm hoping there's a good acceptance and a good, um, I would say, um, yeah, I, I'm hoping we basically people accept and appreciate what Sony's trying to offer. But again, I also hope that Sony starts expanding their marketing, uh, their availability. This year is a little bit challenging with the chip shortage that's going to be happening a little bit later on. So there's going to be components issues. Those are things that we always need to keep in mind. Uh, we're, we're starting to see a lot more processing power, a lot of more components and chips available in other devices than just smartphones. Uh, and of course, AI, uh, IoT type things, you know, cars are starting to become even more reliant on them. So hopefully they're able to produce more and hopefully it'll be available in more markets. So I, I'm with you on that one. Uh, let me see here. Da, da, da. Earl Owen say, man, thanks, man. <laughs> I do want to open it up, but I just don't have the processor to install. I would love to be able to do a live install. Maybe we'll do that next Saturday. I'll, I'll bring up the desktop, open it up. And as we're answering questions, I'm actually changing and installing the AIO in there. Um, I hear this one's actually quite complicated to install because um, supposedly, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> um, yeah, so each fan has two cables, and the actual header, uh, the header unit itself has also two cables, one that goes to the IQ manager, and then a dummy one that goes to the processor of the motherboard. I like this one. Super chilled. TK After Dark. No, I'm just kidding. Hello. <laughs> that TK After Dark is a, is a Juan Carlos and myself's edition there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, DK, yes, uh, TK did get a package. Uh, oh man, look at that, dude. Okay, Dominic Wong. Uh, oh, dude. Okay, thank you. First, first and foremost, thank you for the super chat. Absolutely blow, blows that out of the water there. Thank you very much. Um, and um, so TK. So here, let's let's I'm gonna read it on on this side a little bit bigger. So TK, I've given up on the 3080 Ti. I I I'm with you on that one. Uh, and I'm starting to look at the 6900 XT instead. I don't want to keep um, on con cons consistently waiting for a card. AMD uh, Fidelity FX Super Resolution is coming on the 22nd of June as well. So. 
the, the form is when it comes down to gaming. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. The X, the 6900 XT is hands down one of the best options you can get. Uh, it actually does beat up, uh, beat out the 3080, not the TI, the 3080 uh, NVIDIA GPU card. Um, so if you're considering getting something like that and keeping in mind that the 3080 Ti, from what I've seen, at least since I don't have a chance to play with one yet, uh, is uh, and what I mean by yet means I haven't found one yet, which it keeps losing on that one, uh, is the uh, that it's basically almost like a stopgap between the 3080 and the 3090. Uh, it's closer to the 3090 in performance, but it essentially has a 3080 body and, a, and it's essentially an overclocked version of the 3080, which typically those are where the TIs are. They're overclocked. So uh, what I say essentially is it, it, you know, should you stick with it? Unless there's a specific reason for you to need NVIDIA's performance, uh, specific performance. Yeah, no, the 6900 XT uh, for the most part is I think the better solution to go with, especially for what you're looking for. And with the new updates that they're pushing through uh, for gaming performance and uh, improvement, that gap between NVIDIA and, and, and uh, AMD is being very becoming very, very small. Uh, and optimizations for AMD cards are also coming up now for more gamers, for more games and systems. It's just that when it comes down to suite of production, especially with CUDA cores and what we're able to do to produce content, um, I'd love to be able to basically uh, produce content only in 4K and higher, 4K 60 all the time. But I'm, I'm, it's funny to say this, but the 2080 Ti, which is barely a year old, cannot support a 4K uh, 4K stream, 4K60 stream for me editing uh, at full resolution. I have to drop it down to one fourth. But not only that, once you start stacking, and I'm talking about basically adding uh, different clips, different effects, and so on, it gets even more bogged down. And to top it off that I have two displays in the back. I need a strong enough of a GPU. At one point for the longest time, my main system ran on one monitor. Last year, with the with everything going on, I upgraded to two, but not only two, two wide-angle monitors that are running on DisplayPort. And I can say that the 2080 Ti is doing a decent job at, 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 at working with it, but it still hasn't, uh, I don't think it, it fits the bill yet. So those are the reasons why I'm looking at it. But for sure, dude, uh, the 6900 XC, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on it once you're able to get one. Uh, and it's something that I think a lot of people should consider. AMD team, t, you know, AMD has been doing amazing. Again, one of the reasons why I've switched from Intel to AMD for the last three to four years now, and I have not looked back specifically at all, like with with when it comes down to those. Um, oh, hold on, hold on. Joey's jumping back with Sony stuff. I love that. Sony's uh, saying with uh, the the W the WF one thousand XM four. So uh, announcement. Uh, next week okay uh and the price revealed uh that uh, the xperia one mark three is going to be about 1298 dollars us uh, makes it perfect for a for a power couple so i'm hoping that we're going to see a combo between the two because of the announcement of the uh, xm4 is coming in earlier than the actual smartphone uh but yes no for sure uh, look, the xperia one mark three is absolutely going to get to deliver a a better experience than what we saw from two previous generations Xperia uh, ones from Sony. Um, it's going to give us obviously the best experience. We already know what they're able to, what they're capable of doing, and they've demonstrating it over and over with the Xperia One Mark II. So uh, anything they can add to that to, to be improve the audio. I mean, we have three hundred. There's going to be three sixty audio, I think, on the new one, if I'm not mistaken. So those are things to keep in mind. So for sure, yeah, an absolute power couple for, uh, to, to be dealt with for sure. Um, uh, Moises uh, Silva saying sales in China are stronger than expected. I think it's because the the their their the release is essentially first there, and I I also think there's a lot of people outside of China that are buying it, not necessarily people just in China. So yes, initially only place in the world available in China. You're going to start seeing some heavy sales, especially since it was an an interesting uh, change in approach than what we've seen from Sony before. If there's one thing to say about Sony is that they're they're not you know their inconsistency is the only consistent part of the story. So. What we see now essentially is that they're seeing stronger sales there. I'm hoping that that'll help them indicate a, a much sooner release for the rest of the market. So the fact that it's being sold tells us that they're ready to release it. We are in the summer. This is the time. So it's literally a matter of time before we see it. And is it going to be at around 1290, 1298, like Joey's saying, or is it going to be closer to what we saw with that direct translation? I think I saw somewhere where it's closer to about $1,400 to compare to what you compare uh, to the price point in, in, uh, in Chinese yuan. So we'll have to see how that goes. Let me see here. So Greg is saying, yeah, I hope the Pixel 6 won't be that much. I, I'm I'm hopeful that, that Google is going to try to support 
uh, their existing fan and at the band, the existing fan base uh, for Team Pixel, as well as the ability of having people be able to afford the Pixel 6. You don't want to price it out just because you're going with your own SOC. Offer different, uh, res- you know, different configurations. So that's why I'm thinking the six may not be the, uh, around there. I think when he said six over a thousand, is just very, very far fetched. Uh, if anything, I think that maybe the pro, depending on the configuration with storage, but not the beginning price. I, I, I hope that they're not going to forget the success that happened last year with the Pixel Five, uh, and and just jump and go back to Pixel Four A pricing and and expect people to bounce back. Uh, so we'll have to see. Uh, early in China, okay. Um, early sales in China for Xperia, they're, they're sold out for the first uh, initial batch, which is something to keep in mind. Also, they, Sony does not make uh, massive batches, so their initial batches more than likely was specific to that market based on anticipated sales. So there's always going to be less dem- less availability onto the demand, and if anything, it creates more of a hype. This is 3080 Ti in China, but in in the whole conversation around uh, Xperia One Mark II. So we'll ha- we'll have to see how that comes up. Uh, Ken, oh, Ken X is coming back here. Okay. So speaking of cars, TK, is it true? Is it, oh, sorry. Um, is it true? It's really hard, uh, finding replacement parts for your, for your Tesla. It might be a way, uh, for me, uh, from buying, from buying one for my wife. Um, I, so it's hard for me to comment on this one a little bit right now, mostly because it's, it's early. I've only had the car for, I want to say I got it on the 26th or the 27th of March. So we're in May, uh, June. So I've only had it literally for over two months. Um, Parts and availability on us here in the U- at least for us in the U.S. is not hard. There's enough service centers, enough um, uh, places for us to be able to go fix. It. At least for me, there's two, if not three, service centers that are within short di- driving distance for me, um, and I haven't had to actually use them. The only thing that I would probably say that is still on the back of my mind every time I go for a drive is the fact that the car has no donut and it does not have any type of spare tire kind of an uh, approach. Uh, so. That would be my only thing. So they do sell third-party kits for like I think it was if I'm not mistaken about 350 bucks, where you're able to basically buy a spare to- a spare donut, put it in the under uh, trunk compartment, and then that becomes a little bit more of a safety. But as far as components and parts, um, it's I haven't really researched it. Uh, typically, with the fact that this is a fourth generation of the Model Three, the body hasn't really changed much. Uh, minor changes here and there with the actual like you know the head the headlights and so on, but the overall aesthetics. Uh, the part, the components haven't been hard for me to find, um, and accessories are just all over the place. So I'm, I'm not. I hope I'll be able to answer that once I do end up hitting a situation like that. Uh, but again, I waited on the Model Three specifically for that. I did not want to go in on first, second generation where they're still working things out. By this generation, I feel like the improvements that they've done with the 2021 model, l- listen to some of the concerns that people were modding. Like they literally went and saw what people were doing to their cars once they picked up a Tesla and they incorporated them as a feature. The wireless, char- wireless charging pad, the power trunk, those are big features. The double pane glass on the, uh, on the side, the new lights on the front, the heat pump for better conf- uh, for better uh, heat management in the car. Now, mind you, I don't really deal too much with the heat pump, maybe once or twice a year in Southern California. But for me, those are things that people pay attention to uh, and the charging stations and, and the ability of being able to get the car charged up um, anywhere and almost anywhere you want to go. For me in Southern California, if you, it worked out perfectly. So I would definitely recommend it if you're thinking about it. And I will shamelessly plug in my uh, referral code. But it's just uh, if you're looking to, to be able to get some supercharging miles, uh, I haven't seen any issues. I would not anticipate problems, again, especially since it, this is the fourth generation. Uh, the manufacturing issues and everything else that they're dealing with other areas, it's different. Our cars, at least in the U.S., are manufactured here. So for, like mine was made in Fremont. Uh, there's going to be the Texas plant. There's a whole bunch of different things to keep in mind. Uh, they're definitely supporting their primary markets uh, for sure. Let me double check here. Uh, Davin, NVIDIA. Oh, da- okay. Now I jumped one more time all the way to the end. This this is typically what happens. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Oh, uh Moises Silva saying is that the Pixel, sorry, the uh, the uh, Xperia Five Mach Three more than likely would be close to a thousand dollars. So, if that's a thousand bucks, then and the other one is about thirteen hundred. That that's about the price difference that they had last year. And I'm when I mean twelve hundred is, um, it, it's the um, the pricing that we saw last year between the different Xperia Five Mark Two and the Xperia, uh, one, uh, f- uh, sorry, the Xperia One Mark Two was about three hundred bucks. So that that is realistic. Uh, ta, ta, ta. 
<laughs> Masby, Masby say, ouch, says Ford. I know it, it's, it's really more of a, it uh, depends on the market that you're in and, and what you're looking for. Ford and, and other companies like Ford, Nissan, so on, they, we need more charging stations. That's just a fact right now. Electric cars will not pick up till it gets to the point where it stops becoming a concern for a user that they're going to run out of juice. If you're thinking of range all the time, you're not going to be enjoying the car and you're not likely going to make a decision to buy that car unless, you know, like it's a second car or so on. For me, I test drove the, the Mach 3 a long time, uh, the the uh, S, sorry, the Model 3, not the Mach 3, uh, the Model 3 a few years back. And I had the opportunity to check it out. I happened to live near a supercharging station, two of them, actually, I'm almost in between. Uh, those were a big a big uh, incentive for me. But when I went over and test drove my, my Mach-E, the, the guy at the dealership didn't really do a good job of explaining to me where I could charge my car. His explaining explanation to me was that the entire area that I lived in, there was one charging station that I was able to go to. And that to me did not make sense. I did some more research and I realized that obviously he was just misinformed. There was more information, more things available. But at the end of the day, I felt like Tesla still dominated in that market. And that's one of the reasons why I chose them. Uh, not because I didn't test drive other cars. I did test drive the Mach-E, uh, but I did, I did see the, the, that what I was looking for at the end of the day was a car that I did not have to worry about my charging. We went down to San Diego, uh, not that long ago, maybe a, few, a month and a half ago with the family. I parked my car at an EV charging station, charged it up when I was at the zoo and came out and drove the car back home, not having to stop at a supercharging. That was convenient. Uh, everywhere I go, uh, you know, the malls and so on, they have charging stations and it works with Teslas and it works with other cars. So we're seeing, seeing the improvement, but I feel like we need more and we need more and we need them more to be consistent at a faster pace, not the, um, I would say the trickle charge options that we sometimes see where they're so slow, it defeats the purpose of even using them. And also, I don't want us to see superchargers all the time. Superchargers are great, but they're not good for the battery life of the car. You know, I love the ability of charging my car from zero to 90% in about 35 minutes, but that's not something I want to do all the time. I don't want to nuke the battery on this thing. I want it to last me a few years. So yeah, for sure. Um, Marilyn's uh, jumping. Hey, Marilyn, hope you're doing well. Uh, Marilyn's saying, for me, hybrid makes uh, uh, seems to make uh, more sense. And it is. It's starting to make more sense when you start thinking of a hybrid car. Uh, Prius did that, did that massive uh, revolutionary understanding where people started to appreciate a hybrid car more often. I love the way Toyota does um, their hybrid technology over some of the other manufacturers, specifically when it comes down to, uh, you know, when they use the word hybrid for the sake of the word hybrid, but it's not really hybrid, like the hybrid gets one more mile per, uh, per mile uh, on, an, on the range. That to me is a, a manufacturer that's seriously not doing their job and they're doing, they're insulting the user base when they say, my standard model does 19 miles a gallon. My hybrid does 20. You should go hybrid. No, they're putting the hybrid so they have the hybrid. It's almost like they're lost cause. Now we're seeing them doubling down and going full on with the with the electric options. And that's going to force the electric charging ecosystem to boom. It's going to be a big market. It's going to keep growing. And the more we see those, the better it's going to be for us in the future to be able to rely on other, on other options that we can start charging and leaving by. And in and, and, and basically trying to reduce the usage of gas. Natural gas is available, obviously, but crude oil is just overly used and prices are just going to keep going up. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, they need to universal stand. Yeah, uh, can ex exactly. I feel like the standard needs to be set. Um, we have adapters to be able to use ex uh, these Teslas with them, but we don't have other options. Like again, Nissan Leaf, uh, the Mach-E cannot go to a, uh, to a Tesla's charging station to charge. Now, don't get me wrong. As a Tesla owner, I like the fact that it is exclusive to Tesla. So you can kind of make sure that at least there's always a spot available. But with more adoption, more availability, those fears are going to go away. So we'll have to see. Uh, more, so that's actually a good question. So the Ford F-150 Lightning uh, is rated at 300 miles. And um, I will say my understanding of the, the 300 mile range that they uh, that they stated uh, changed dramatically after I saw Marquez's video that he did on it. Uh, I was surprised because, sorry, I wasn't able to actually find anything other than what he said in that video to, to, to support that statement that he said. But essentially it's a 300 mile range with a thousand pounds worth of weight in the trunk, which means 
the car on average when it's running empty the truck i mean uh, should be able to get longer uh, ranges those were always kind of the concerns that we looked at uh, the mach e i want to say the california edition had the 300 mile range uh, but that was a special edition that costs way more than what the standard model uh, you know model 3 did so to me those are kind of compromises you have to kind of keep in mind right now it's ford's first electric sedan ford's first electric truck so again would you if you, would would what we know now from what uh, tesla had to deal with at the beginning with the release of the first model three model two, second generation so on would you double down and jump on that or would you go with what's been tried and true i think at this point we're still at the point where i would probably say tesla still wins because of the experience that they have mostly because of what they have what we have currently with the ecosystem i may not at some point if i decide to upgrade from the model 3 go to another tesla by that point i'm hoping we have more options and they we're starting to see the first generations of those and again within the two to three years or so three to four years depending on where we are that may be the next uh, solution it may end up being a mach -E. uh it, the car drove very nicely it felt like i was driving a regular car it did not feel like it was electric uh, with the exception of the model uh the uh, configurations that we had in there uh, Earl, the EVs coming uh, from VW, Audi, and other non-Tesla uh, with ranges of 225 miles, uh, that, that has me thinking these other manufacturers are not concerned with range. I think whenever i see those type of solutions whenever we see cars come out like you know we see a brand new car it's like okay we have, and then they use the word long range 230 miles they're not concerned with range they're really building these cars as cars that are going to live in a specific town system and what i mean by this let me explain take an example would be like somebody that lives in los angeles i'm using la it's a big city obviously some cities are a lot smaller you buy a car like this be it uh, you know with a 300 230 uh, uh, 230 mile range and keep in mind 230 advertised epa range means about 180 to 200 we're not going to get to 30 I'm also not trying to say that the two, uh, 352 miles that i was sold on on my long range is going to actually occur Again, always expect less. It's intended for areas where you live, essentially, you know, that, you, that the longest duration or the longest distance that you're going to go in your car on average will basically be maybe 30 to 40 miles in one way, and you're going to be coming back. And if you're charging at home, that ecosystem is actually sustainable. It's just it's not designed to be traveling with this for long distances. That's the, that's the main concern that you want to keep in mind. So while they're building these cars and selling them, you can see that their focus isn't really on giving you a car that's truly replacing your, your gas uh, using car. They're giving you a car that kind of gets you almost all the way, makes you feel better that you're using electric as opposed to using gas, but they're not just giving you that whole experience. So you're still kind of reliant on making this a secondary car. So they're building it, I think, in that specific approach. Tesla doesn't have gas cars. Tesla doesn't compete with its own brand. They're not having to you know, cannibalize their own existing car lineup to be able to sell you another car. The other OEM or the other carrier, uh, the car manufacturers are having to do so, right? They're competing with their own gas consuming cars at the same time trying to release something new. It's a weird approach kind of saying, hey, we have the veggie burger and we have the regular meat burger. They're both great burgers. But I don't want to make it sound like this one is better than this because I want you to still buy more of my stuff. So that's always going to be the, the approach. Um, uh, I think Ford is definitely one of the biggest cars that can definitely push us in the right direction. But this is the thing. This is year one. It's the second and third year is where we're going to start seeing some of those improvements. This is why I'm, I'm excited to see what's going on. More electric cars means a bigger ecosystem and a much better support for EVs. That means by the next generation of EVs, the, the next big car generation, we get version two of Mach-E, version two of Lightning, or version two of uh, you know the i3s and so on. Those are the cars that are going to be exciting because we would, at that point, see more EVs and they're no longer worried about cannibalizing their existing lineup because they still want you to buy cars right sorry i know we, we've converted the live stream into a car show but i this is a very big uh emotional thing because i really like teslas and i, I obviously as since i drive i always feel very strong about those uh, i feel like the folks that, uh, folks that don't get tesla because uh it's it's electric uh more about uh the autopilot and the ecosystem uh so the autopilot is nice but it's not necessarily the biggest thing about it so yeah the electric part is is a big factor um I installed a home charger for me here because I knew that was something going to be a, a long run. I wasn't trying to rely on the uh, on the ecosystem of chargers only. Uh, although when I do travel, I'm not going to lie that if I'm planning a trip outside of Los Angeles, meaning outside of the Los Angeles general area, county, 
um, I typically will will research where chargers are going to be, and I typically will try to plan my route around them and make sure things are working. So those are things you do keep in mind. It's an electric vehicle. I want to get to the day where I don't have to do that. But now I, I know that if I go down to San Diego, I know where the superchargers are. I know where the other options. If I want to go down to the San Diego Zoo, if I want to go down to Magic Mountain, I want to go down to Disneyland, I want to be able to make sure to, that it becomes more available. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Tesla just is Tesla. And it is, for the lack of a better term, their own ecosystem is somewhat of a, uh, people do te te tend to basically uh, you know think about that when they're getting into that car. Uh So, yeah, so uh, Moises is actually putting in a good comment. So a few European brands want to have um, only electric cars by 2035. And that's because they, that's their projection of projection of how the ecosystem is going to be and how affordable they're going to be able to get these cars. Right now, electric cars are somewhat of a premium, right? I mean, at some point when we first, when the CD player first made its appearance in a car, it was a super expensive feature and you were adding a whole bunch of different things. We don't even have them anymore. My Tesla doesn't have a CD player. It doesn't even have any, I mean, other than a USB thumb drive option, I, I don't even know if I can play music off a thumb drive. I know I can change my, my honk on that. But I'm, what I'm trying to say essentially is that their approach to the, to the, uh, to the uh, ecosystem is always going to be, it's, it's expensive right now, it's new. By 2035, we're going to be in, so we're in 2021 right now. So that would be literally 14 more years, 14 more generations of electric cars. And at that point, I probably would say, yes, maybe the cars would still be option 50-50, but I'm almost tempted to say it's going to be the other way around where it's more electric than gas. Uh, you're still going to be dealing with existing gas cars that are going to be sold within the next 10 to 15 years, obviously. So it's not ever going to disappear. That transition is going to take some time uh, because the renewable factor of this and also better sources for generating electricity are also going to need to be kind of sustained. Uh, using more electricity to charge cars where you're not using it directly from fossil fuels is just you're, you're shifting the, the, the demand, obviously. So the electric grid needs to also kind of improve to be able to support those. And other sources, other renewable sources need to be used to generate electricity electricity to support those systems. So I hope so. Uh, Tesla is only very po is is only very popular in America and in China. Right now, yes. Um, and I know in Europe, I think in Germany, they're building another one of their factories. We, we've seen other cars. You're right. Uh, it, it's something to keep in mind where things are and where you are. And that's one of the appeal. If, if it didn't have the existing ecosystem and popularity in the US, I probably wouldn't have considered the, uh, the Tesla Model 3. I probably would have gone with another Ford, uh, probably another, uh, you know, Explorer or something like that. You're right. It, it is. It's a big factor what we make a decision on. Uh, Aditya is jumping back with Dominic. Uh, Electric cars and Dominic Park saying electric cars are very expensive in Europe. And I think that's because of the availability and what's going on right now. So the more more models come out, the prices will come down. And I think that's the biggest thing. We're starting to realize, or I think companies and countries are starting to realize global warming and, and emissions from our vehicles are a big factor. Having a car, I mean, this is excluding the, the price of gas. I'm talking about the fact that the emissions, the, the carbon, the uh, the pollution that the cars generate, those are big factors into what we do on a daily basis. Um, one thing we all learned during the, the lockdowns from last year was that the earth actually took a little break where no cars were being driven, gas prices dropped, Air started to feel better. We started to breathe a little bit better, easier around. The, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, we normally have a not, in like a natural haze. I'm not saying natural. I'm saying consistent, um, and that's actual smog. It's not. It's not a haze. It's not. It's not a natural fog. It's smog, it, it, and you see it in some pictures taken of Los Angeles. Typically, goes away right after rain, but otherwise, it's silly, silly. You know, it's just sitting there. So I, I always feel like this is something to keep in mind. Um, but I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, Greg just hit me straight up up the head and he's like, TK, it's that time of the show. You're right, my friend. It is. Uh, we are at the hour and 42 minutes of the show. I can't believe it. Okay. Two things I can't believe. First, I forgot to turn on the bottom monitor. Second, it is an hour and 40 minutes into the show. Uh, so with that being said, as I'm going through some more of the comments here, um, I do want to say thank you to everybody, obviously, for checking out the, chow, uh, the, the, the show. Uh, but please, if you don't mind, um, as you see right there with the comment that I have uh, pinned to the show, uh, it's TK Seption. It is that time of the show where we typically like to do a TK Seption part of the show. Uh, and he, it, just if you don't mind.